a that's a <sighs> non upload. Is it? Should it be an upload? I guess. I don't know. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay, so what are we actually gonna do? We're gonna play again together. I thought I said don't forget to complete your underwear adventure. We have to buy this. <laughs> Eventually. We have to buy it and then suddenly change our Minecraft thing to the Spongebob <laughs> resource pack. It's not even... It's like the new Minecraft DLC where it's like an entire licensed game. Just oh, so we're just Minecraft. we're just going to play it one day. Yeah, it'll be a separate playlist. Yeah. Okay. Spongebob <laughs> Minecraft. <laughs> so we could play more Cuphead, but I don't know if you're in the mood for that. I would have said yes if I hadn't just rage quit Donkey Kong Jr. Did you rage quit? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. There's also Minecraft. For our long-standing games. Yes. But if you were just more in like a one-off, random, weird, kooky game. I think we've been doing a lot of series recently. I kind of just want to do a one-off. We have been doing a lot of series. And that's what I was going to tell you, is that if you look at the start of it, every single thing we did is like Towerfall 1, Towerfall 2, Arms 1, Arms 2, Smash 1, Smash 2. Yeah. And now it's like the entire month of December is just Minecraft and Cuphead and Top D and 2D. <laughs> now, if you wanted to change any of the episodes or videos that are on White Guys or White Christmas, I'd be perfectly fine with that. I don't care. Okay. Like, if I upload this Kirby thing, and you go, I want the Kirby thing to be on White Christmas instead. I just do it. We need to play... <laughs> We need to play this eventually. <laughs> oh my goodness. The game is very hand-holdy, so it doesn't matter that you can't read anything. <laughs> it's just like the Kirby game. <laughs> Are there any fun just play this games? Uh, we could play Mario Kart. I was about to say Mario Kart. We could play that. That'd be fun with Mario Kart. <laughs> Pokemon, let's go. Please, no. Uh, I gave Pokemon Let's Go a chance because of you. Sorry. And I'm... Wait, because of me? I'm absolutely mad about it. Why because of me? What did I do? There is a... video where I was making fun of Pokemon Let's Go by saying it had terrible graphics and terrible story and all that stuff, and you were like, it's really not that bad. So I went, it's the Pokemon React video. So I went back and I played it. And I was like, this is awful. I can't believe Christian made me play this. And now I have an even worse impression of the game. So now we have to play it for white guys. <laughs> oh, I don't want to just, I don't want to be the Aaron of Sonic. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't. No, I will gladly be the Aaron of Sonic. I hate Sonic. But, but that for Pokemon Let's Go. Oh, dude. Speaking of Sonic Party Valley. Speaking of Sonic. No, hold on, let me fix that. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of Sonic. Dang it. Um something really cool happened in the world of Sonic recently where uh, a full blooded Newgrounds artist got to make a uh, cover for one of the Sonic comics. Like So not a Sonic thing, but a Newgrounds thing. But still a Sonic thing. And it's like a... They have like over 4,000 followers on Newgrounds, which is a big for Newgrounds. And they uh, they co-created Ritz the Rat with Ninja Muffin. And Ninja Muffin's one of the Funkin' creators. And Ritz the Rat is like a big deal on Newgrounds. <laughs> and... Uh, they're also uh, one of the uh, Friday Night Funkin' merchandise artists. So, it was awesome. I Let's go Newgrounds. I pre-ordered that comic just because... Solidarity. <laughs> when was the last time you played Mario Kart? Don't remember. I don't either. <laughs> I was thinking about Mario Kart the other day. 
because of that Alfred video. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just thinking about it, and I was like, yeah, I don't remember the last time I played it. And then I saw Mario Kart on here, and I was like, oh, well, I can remember the last time I played it now. I don't have the DLC. What do I care? The people might care. Well, screw the people! Well, here's the thing. If we don't play the DLC maps or use the DLC characters, they're not going to know. No, they'll know. How? They'll figure it out. I'll just cut it. I'll just cut until we're in the middle of a race. <laughs> cut the menus out completely. <laughs> yeah. Just in the, in the race, you can be like, oh, wow, I can't believe we're not getting any of the DLC maps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can pick your maps. So we'll just be like, yeah, but oh, I'm yeah, like we just feel like playing this one, and it just so happens it's none of the DLC maps. <laughs> and we'll mention the DLC maps and be like, yeah, that's a pretty oh, terrible God. map. I'm really glad we're not playing that. <laughs> and then we'll commit to the bit for two minutes before dropping it because we don't care anymore. And then the download episode will be over and we'll actually play Mario Kart and go through the menu. <laughs> uh, I love downloading things. <laughs> Give me a ride on your cart and you ain't getting it. <laughs> <laughs> your cart. We have to play Double Dash. Yes. We have to. I we, need have to, to we have to do a separate one and the same cart one. I need to borrow mm. slash steal. I have Double Dash. Or is it something else? No, I was going to say Double Dash. I have it. Okay. Everyone, welcome back to the League of Legends episode. <laughs> I'm not, sorry. Not yet. <laughs> not today. Not ever. Um, what? Is that going to be a one white guys thing? Raw upload <laughs> I'll just upload a 40 minute video of me playing League one day and you go, Dylan, what is this? It's, I move worldwide among us Fortnite classics and I put League on Christmas Day. I would kill you. It would actually be one white guy. I just delete the worldwide classic Fortnite video. That would, I would, I would be so mad. <laughs> Why? Because it's a funny video and I like it a lot. Ugh. <sighs> For it's, real, for real? Yes. It starts off slow like every white guy's and then gets good like every white guy's. It's just how we are. Like, we take a minute to adapt to the game and then we pull out the shenanigans. The shenanigans. Yeah. How's Mario Kart going to go? We're going to play Mario Kart and then we're going to keep playing Mario Kart. And then we're going to play Mario Kart... Here's the thing. Neither one of us have to remember how to play Mario Kart. Yeah. So there's not going to be any, oh, and like figuring out of stuff. We're just going to be doing stuff we already know how to do. Right. You know how uh, on Instagram and Facebook and stuff, they had new meta avatars? No. Well, they do, and my brother made his Joe Biden. It looks exactly like him. <laughs> Mostly. And he's a little more wrinkles. I think that's the best he could do. But it, I don't think that's his fault. I just think there's not this really... This is mine. <clears throat> you look like that one guy, but I can't remember his name. It, it which looks, is insulting. It looks pretty much like me. Mostly. Close as I could get, I guess. You probably couldn't get much better. Yeah. I mean... It... It's as close as you can get with the, like, soul-sucking, like, meta avatar. I don't know if this is a hot take or a regular take, but I've always thought those things were bad. Like the bitmojis. Oh, Or the meta avatars. Or, like, the animojis on Apple. Yeah, that's what I'm, like... Well, the animojis are a little different. I'm talking about the ones that you create of yourself. No, that's what I'm saying, yeah. They're, you don't create the are, animal emojis. That's just, like, an but, animal talking. But those are still considered animojis, like, animated emojis. It just so happens animal but, and animated stuff are the same thing. I think the animal ones are fine, but the people ones are not. Yeah, the animal ones are funny. Because it's just it's just the lion, right? Yeah, it's like, the I love the picture of the, like... <laughs> Uh, it's like a text message and it's like your grandfather has passed away and it responds with the hog having his mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. They're funny. 
But the bit, but the individual like created people. Yeah, those are cringe. They're cringe. And that's the word I was trying to avoid saying, but it's what I keep thinking of they're, in my head. They just, I can't think of a better way to say it. They're like Xbox 360 avatars, but worse. I know. I didn't even hate Xbox 360 yeah. avatars because I felt like it. Those at least they were. They every weren't. Every single person that looks like Stampy the cat is gonna have the exact same avatar. If you have that poofy hair, you're gonna all have the exact same poofy hair. I just feel like if you have, they all just are wannabe me's. <clears throat> they're just. It feels like there's no actual realness to them. I like, think. Part of the reason why Mies work so well is because they're not trying to like be this cartoonish like Disney realism. I think the closer that your avatar looks like to an actual picture of you, the more generic and default NPC human you just look like. Right. Or are. Depending on the energy you exude. Like Raising Cane's chicken. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing this. I get the reference. It's like, uh, with, uh... When did I give my Mia beard? I don't remember. Baby Ouija time. But it's like... With this... Hi. It looks vague enough like me. To where you're like, oh, that's Christian. I just don't... I don't I'm not making fun of yours. I'm just saying, in general, I just think Mies are just better. No, I mean, that's what I was trying to say. No, I'm agreeing with you. I just like, don't know how to explain I that. think it's because, like... These are abstractions of what you look like. It's not actually trying to replicate what you look like. It has more of a soul to it because it's not actually just like <clears throat> trying to be realistic. Yeah. What do you mean you don't have the DLC? All the DLC from 8 was included in the 8 Deluxe base game. I thought that's... Oh, there's DLC in Deluxe? Yeah, the, the booster pass or whatever. With like all those tracks? Yeah, I have not purchased it. I'm gonna probably buy that. I'm kind of worried for Nintendo's future. Why so? Because they're in their, um, their era where every single thing that they do is like everything. Like, they drop every single Smash character. They're dropping every single Mario Kart track in one game. Yeah. I'm worried about it just because, Whenever like, they did it for Smash, I was like, okay, well, now it's either going to be expected they do every single character every time, or they're going to have to create an entire new roster for more Smash games. Because if they only include, like, some of the characters, people are going to be really mad about it. Do you want to choose the courses or do random? I'd be fine with random. Okay. I'm worried about their future for... Do you want to do computers or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, what difficulty? Normal or hard. Okay. Um, let's just do four. Okay. Um, I'm worried about Nintendo's future for a slightly different reason because as with like the era of... Like in the era of DLC and stuff, uh, with Nintendo already shutting down the uh, storefronts for the Wii U and 3DS, that means there's a lot of content you just can't play anymore. Like, uh, you can't play, you can't get the DLC characters for Smash 4, you can't get the, uh, you can't get the DLC for Mario Bros. 2, you can't get, uh, or New Super Mario Bros. 2, I should say, which had, like, some bonus courses and stuff. You can't get, um, the Fire Emblem Fates DLC, which is an entire, like, separate storyline. Literally, what they're doing is, uh, the window to purchase uh, Fire Emblem Fates on the 3DS eShop is a month before <laughs> the uh, eShop itself closes, so you have time to progress in Fire Emblem Fates and get to the part where you can buy the DLC before the eShop closes. So they know it's like, hey, you're not going to be able to play an entire third of this game anymore. Interestingly enough, Nintendo kind of makes me mad about that, but I think it's, it's, Nintendo was very odd in that area because 
it, one of two things is going to happen, in my opinion. It's just a guess. Or one of three things, I guess you could say. The, the consoles, or the games, that have that DLC are either going to sell for a million dollars in the future. Yeah, like iPhones that still have Flappy Bird. Which I have one. Which I think is really cool, but I always forget that fact until someone brings it up. Right. Or, I think it's an iPhone 4, I don't know. Or, it's going to be one of those where not having the DLC gets you a million dollars. Like, what if all the, like, what if people are frantic and they get every single copy that they know of and get it to the DLC thinking that in the future the DLC is going to be wanted? No, but so now there's just a bunch of copies of DLC floating around and there's no original copies that don't have the DLC added to No, but the thing it. is, it's not like, it's just the system itself. I mean, like, um... So it's like... Like, if you buy Smash Brothers for the Wii U on, like, a disc, uh -huh. it's not going to have the DLC on it. No. But then you can go and download that DLC, right? No, because the eShop will close. That's what I'm saying. So it's like... So you'll have a disc and a hard drive that has no DLC on it, and it might end up being valuable to people because everyone already has the DLC, and you already buy them with the DLC, and it's yes, hard to find like, an original blank slate. What I'm worried about is the future... Or nothing will happen. The future where, like, some kid gets a used Switch, and not thinking about it, they format it and, like, add their own whatever, and then they get... Uh, Mario Odyssey and they can't get like a bunch of costumes or they get Smash Bros and they don't have 12 of the characters or they don't have arms they get arms and they don't have uh, a third of the characters because five of them are DLC because Nintendo's in that era where they they don't finish a game until like months after launch and under the guise of it being a quote unquote live service and then once they've actually finished the game with all the content that should have been there at launch they uh just move on and dump it. That's what they did with ARMS. Admittedly, even though ARMS is one of my favorite games, it was a little half-baked at launch. That's what they're doing with all the Mario sports games. Um, that's what they did with tennis. That's what they did with golf. That's what they're currently they doing. They kind of do it with Smash Bros., but also it's kind of the Smash Bros. gimmick. No, I think Smash Bros. was already a finished game. They were just adding more to it. I feel like the Smash Bros. gimmick is just to add DLCs to get people hype and still talking about the game. Right, because that's part of the appeal of Smash Bros. is seeing what character gets added next. But it still fits in the same category of they're selling an unfinished game. Because if they already have the idea to put out DLC, they know they're selling a game that they're bringing out DLC for. Right. But I also think... it's kind of weird because you want to give it a pass. I, I do think Ultimate was a complete package without any DLC. But you are still missing out on great content without the DLC. You're missing 12 characters. Like, 12 characters. You're, you're missing Sora, Steve, You're missing 12, char 12 characters, 13 stages, stage builder, which should have been there at launch. Uh, and I don't see a difference between that and some of these other games. Like, I think it's still unfinished. I think in terms of the characters and stages themselves, they should have... I think that's fine. They're but, still coming out with Mario Golf characters. But in terms of uh, like stage builder not being there until Joker's update, which was the second like <clears throat> big patch, I think that's <clears throat> unfinished content. Oh yeah, because if you just buy the disc, and Nintendo Switches aren't online anymore, right? You can't download the updates. Uh, right. Right. So it's like you're missing out on, like, uh, WarioWare was a finished game. That was very refreshing. I'm going to agree with you, but also disagree. Um, because I think you're right, and you're, you're true-telling, and there's going to be a limited amount. However, they sell Nintendo cards where you can buy the card and have all the DLC. What do, you, what do you mean? Like, you know you can buy an iTunes card? Yeah. They have Nintendo DLC cards for Smash Bros. Yeah, but once the eShop closes, you can't use them. Are you sure you can't just type it in the game? Yes. Okay. Because the game directs you to the eShop. <clears throat> so it's basically going to be like uh, Among Us on a disc. It's going to be useless. Right. I sincerely think Among Us, since they have physical copies now, should it, like look into local wireless play or LAN play. 
Well, the problem is they're going to have to then put it on the physical copies. No, it's already on physical copies. Oh, oh true. If you said they're going to the have to look into land copies, then they're the going to have to put out an update for it. Because then the physical copies wouldn't have that update, so it's a little too late. Yeah. Okay. But like. But Kirby, I agree. Kirby Star Allies was definitely an unfinished game at launch. Was it? Yeah. I didn't I, know anything about it. I played it at launch. It was uh, the the amount of content that they added afterwards makes it it fall into the same category for me. I don't think Nintendo cares at all, but I don't have internet at my house. If I buy a game or get a game on Christmas, right, I can't update the video game. I have to play the raw video game that they give me, which is going to be completely unfinished and bad. Right. And I don't always get to leave and go places. When I was a kid, I would stay at my house for months and months, and I had a Wii. I think I only had gave that Wii internet access like four or five times oh, in no. its entire lifespan since we bought it. Trust me, I understand. I didn't have internet growing up either, and I never my Wii never connected to the internet. I never had access to any of the Wii Shop channel games. And there's got to be a kid out here with a Switch or a Wii U that's like just keeping it docked at home because their parents won't let them bring it anywhere. Right. And they're going to be sitting there with these unfinished games and no Wi-Fi, and they only get to play a third of every Nintendo right. game that they have. Like, Super Mario Party didn't have online play until like years after. Which I think online play for that game is just dumb. Uh, Miitopia and Mario 3D World are only complete packages because they're ports. <laughs> what about Banana? Monkey uh, Ball. I'd say it's a complete package, but that's not a Nintendo game. I mostly. Oh, I didn't know it was. A no, Nintendo it's game. Uh, Sega. Uh, Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. Pogs. Pokemon, let's go. Uh, Origami King, I think that was a finished game. I don't know if they had DLC. I don't think Pikmin they did. 3 was a finished game. I don't think they ever added DLC to that. Yeah, but it was Port. Oh, port, that was a Port. Port. Pokemon Tournament Deluxe was a good port because they added the uh, content that was exclusive to Japanese arcades. Although they did have a, some weird DLC for it. Uh, what about um see some of these games I don't know how to feel or think or categorize them like um tennis is definitely not finished mm -mm. like um what do you want to call it um what's think... the Pokemon block game Pokemon quest yeah games like that what... Luigi's Mansion 3 was a finished game I, yeah I love Luigi's Mansion 3 did they even have DLC for that Multiplayer. Like, they added new modes. Which is really... Like, nowadays, for Luigi's Mansion 3, I only want to play it with multiplayer. Mm. We should co-op that for white guys. Yeah, we have it on the list. Okay. I think Splatoon was a finished game, but that's a little different because it's, like, actually a live surface game. Yeah. I think... I'm a little worried that Splatoon 3 isn't going to be... It's going to be, like, in this... More so than Splatoon 2 was just Splatoon 1, but again, I think Splatoon 3 is going to be Splatoon 2, but again. You know what I mean? Video games used to come out and then just, like, not get updates. Yeah. And if there was something broken in the video game, it was just broken. Yeah, we're old enough to remember that. And people just had to deal with it. Right. Like, I bought games for the Game Boy Advance. I don't even think there was a way to connect the Game Boy Advance to Wi-Fi. I don't believe so. And if there was, I never knew, and I didn't have Wi-Fi, so it doesn't even matter. You think Pokemon Leaf Green had Wi-Fi? Or do you think they used a link cable? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They just used to do that. Snipper Clips was a finished game that's different because it was an indie game Nintendo published. But just because they have the possibilities to be lazy and do this does not mean they should be. And they should not be getting away with it. Right. Okay, Nintendo. Uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses was a finished game. They did have DLC for it, but I would say it was finished. Okay. Uh, what about Toad? Was that a different person? Captain Toad? Yeah. That was a uh, port from a Wii U game. Uh. But 
it is a little weird because I would argue that it's unfinished because they cut content from the Wii U version in this version and added new content. Like, you could play through certain Mario 3D World stages in Captain Toad, as Captain Toad. But now it's like uh, Dinorama stages based off of Mario Odyssey. They replaced them, which is really strange. Uh, Kirby Star Allah unfinished. We already did it. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe technically finished because it was a port. Uh, if you want to talk about... If you want to compare... Metroid Dread was definitely a finished game. If you want to compare Deluxe to all the DLC they came out... Like, half the game is the DLC now. Right. But, like... It's, like, double the tracks. Triple the tracks. For four years, it wasn't. Yes. I agree. Metroid Dread was good. Metroid Dread was an excellent game. It definitely was finished. And I think while the content that they added in the updates should have been in the base game, I think the base game is still a complete package without it. So far, the content they've added in updates was uh, a hardest, uh, like the hardest difficulty possible, where you die in one hit, and uh, a boss rush mode, which those should have been in the base game. But I think it's understandable why it wasn't. I guess you should release a game, and then fix the game based off of problems that people have. Or if someone goes, right. "I really want this feature," then you can put that feature in the game, like Terraria. Right. Do you I, know anything about that? Kind of. Well, there's a new update coming. It's going to be huge in the game. Mm -hmm. And Red, the guy kind of over it, he has a team, but Red's yeah. kind of over it. He's like on Twitter, on uh, Newgrounds, on Reddit, on all sorts of things. And people keep adding him and being like, hey, what about this idea for Terraria? What about adding this? And he's responding to like 90% of the people who were saying a comment about, what if we added this? And he'd be like, that's a good idea. I'm not really sure about that one working because blah 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 right right like that's what i mean by content or content creators like caring about what the fans think right engaging saying does this fan idea mesh with my vision for the product yes but nintendo just goes now i'm not saying nintendo should look at every single idea and every single thing because that's way too much right that's like saying people that's Plus, like saying that's susan gonna... should watch every single youtube video that gets uploaded right like at a certain point uh, like like we've discussed before, you don't. At a certain point, while you shouldn't make you make things that you like, not things that other people will like, and just because if you're passionate about what you're making, then other people will be passionate about it. At the same time, you do need to. You can't listen to every piece of criticism. But something I think that's really important to pay attention to are the interviews. If you interview. The, or you look at the Nintendo employee interviews from way back in the day. They were excited. It was cool. They were creating this game. They put all this advertisement into this new Donkey Kong idea. Mm -hmm. They put all this emphasis on everything. They were excited. They were like, it was like a passion project for Mar the original Mario. Right. He put so many hours doing digital art by himself just to get the Mario characters to be who they are. Right. Now... You don't hear people being interviewed about any of the games that get released. And the only one I can think of is Smash. And, that's just and Smash has... Ultimate was such a big and good game right. that people loved him and said he needs a break because he works so hard. Sakurai is very, has always been very outspoken about Smash's development and stuff. And he like, you can tell that there's passion in the game and right. there's a big effort because I do think Smash Ultimate is a pretty finished and well taken game on release. I have seen interviews with, I think it was, his name is Mr. Sakamoto, who is the director of the Metroid series. I think so, Talking yeah. about how Metroid Dread is an idea they've wanted to do for years and years and years and how they finally have the like perfect hardware and the perfect team with Mercury Steam to accomplish that goal. And I've seen interviews with... Uh, uh, Mr. Yabuki, who is the director of ARMS and like the creative team who made ARMS and uh, makes Mario Kart. Uh, I don't know if you knew that or not, that the same people who make Mario Kart made ARMS. Uh, In a way, it looks kind of similar, but... I think from the interviews I've seen of that, that they were so. passionate about that project. They were? Yeah. I think 
it's not necessarily you can the... kind of tell because Metroid Dread was always told that it was a great game. The people who played Arms mostly said it's a good game. I think it's not necessarily on the developers that this is an issue. I think it's more an executive deadline thing. Which I'm not saying any single person in particular should be who created the game is being put on blame for this. Right. I just think And it's not like it needs to be fixed as a whole. It's not like the people who worked on Mario Tennis Aces didn't work hard on it. Yeah, because they had to work somewhat hard to at least get those animations to look as nice as they do and all right. the colors and shading. And it's like the people who programmed the gameplay, it's not like they didn't work hard on it. Like, yeah. I don't want to say that. What I do want to say, though, is that I think because of the scheduling constraints and all that stuff, because they weren't... I don't think they were given necessarily... This is just... you know I'm not basing this off of anything in particular... So I don't want to make a definitive statement, but they probably weren't given enough time and money to make it the best game possible. It's just weird. I feel like every single game that Nintendo used to put out, there were interviews, there were people talking, there was a lot of commercials, there were advertisements for everything. Now there's a new Nintendo game put out every three days. Right. And you don't hear about it until a month after its release date. That's uh, my opinion. That's what I think. Yeah. Is that there Unless just... you're like directly following every single thing. Arlo. <laughs> and it's like, uh, I forgot. I think Xenoblade comes out this week. Xenoblade 3. I don't know. There's a new one. It was in the direct we reacted to that many moons ago. You think I watched that? <laughs> but uh, I forgot it came out this week until like I saw an article about it. And it's like... Unless it's your job to keep up with game releases, it's just impossible to keep up with everything. And I don't think that's a Nintendo problem. I think that's just a... It's a it's a good problem to have, I would say. That's also kind of with the boom of indie gaming. It leads to like a bunch of like super good and creative ideas, but they get drowned out in a sea of just tons and tons of titles. I think... Like, uh, I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. I guarantee. I mean, half obviously, the people watching Lawnmower the Next Generation was a big passion project. Right. I, I guarantee half the people watching don't know what Townscaper is. But uh, Townscaper is a very like relaxing experience, and I enjoy it a lot. I bought it. I rebought it on Switch after getting it on Steam, because I just wanted to support the developer who made it, and so. I, some people might not know what Tangle Tower is, and that's a great game. Some people not might not know what uh, the, the Lethal League is. I think um, Lethal League made it up big, though. Lethal League is a little bigger than There most. were official competitions that were like broadcasted. Right, but Lethal it's not League like... It. Uh, like for its release. It's not like Ukulele or Shovel Knight level. Where it's like this big like E3 headliner indie game. You know what I mean? Like it's not... Yeah. Like a Cuphead or a FNAF. Uh, like... It's it's really cool that there are games like Cuphead and FNAF and Hades and Hollow Knight... They're good games. ...that are, like, being recognized at, like, things like E3 and uh, the Game Awards and stuff. Because they're, people are starting to realize that it doesn't matter if your game is AAA or indie or anything in between. They're all video games. Like, as long as you've made something that's interactive media and can be played, uh, you're in competition with everyone else. And I know that's a good thing in its own certain way, but I see that in a negative light. AAA games should not be on the same level as Horace in his basement. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like, if, it's I, like, if I personally go in my bedroom and make a video game, it should not be the same or better quality than a company that has millions of dollars to budge on a video game. Right. Like, like uh, it should not be better than that. And I think that sh there should be a quality drop from AAA titles to indie games. I, I do agree to an extent. Like, I shouldn't have... I'm not saying they should be bad games. With, I'm talking about graphics-wise, at least. Right. Like, there with the big budget... 
that the 2K series has. I shouldn't have had more fun playing a Newgrounds and Itch.io browser game self than I did playing NBA 2K. Which, by the way, play self on Newgrounds and Itch.io. It's, gr- it's, got, it's very fun, very unique. Uh, got a great soundtrack by the one and only Connor Grill. Connor Grill is a good composer. There's also just NBA 2K. <laughs> All those sports games are just the exact same thing with slightly better graphics. Right, but every I'm year. saying like I shouldn't have enjoyed playing this like browser game made by one guy more than a giant yeah. production with like millions of dollars poured into it. Because it has that money and manpower behind it, they should be spending that money and using that manpower to make the like most excellent basketball game you've ever seen. I know, it's. It's slightly different because you don't like those games anyway for majority of the time. I mean, I don't mind them. Like, they're not your specific genre that you really, like, crave for. You don't look for basketball games. I kind of feel like... But in terms you're correct. Of, in terms of my gaming tastes and, like, my music tastes and stuff like that, I'll play pretty much anything yeah. as long as it's it feels good to play. Like, you, you see, like, the variety I yeah. have. Like, I've got, like, first-person shooter, racing game, puzzle platformer, uh, interactive, like, audio experience, whatever Katamari is. <laughs> but your games also look the same. Kind of? They're either really big, mainstream, everyone in the world knows them, or it was just some $2 game that you saw, or it was a really specific indie game that you heard about on, like, Newgrounds or something. Those are, like, your only three genres. You have big mainstream. You have it was because it was five cents in the eShop, and then you have indie games. Like that—that's your specific genre. That's what you play. That's what you big have mainstream. On. Because it was cheap, good indie game. Like that—that's just what almost all of these are, and some of them are a combination, like FNAF. FNAF was made by Scott, and it turned into like a big mainstream game, but it wasn't when it first came out. Yeah, and it's relatively cheap. Yeah, so some of them, like, cross, what do you call it, cross-contaminate, I guess? Venn diagram. The Venn diagram overlaps. But I think for the most part, all of your games fit in that category. Right, but I think... Or indie game based off of a main game, like uh, Bug Fables is based off of Paper Mario. Yeah, I do think you've got a point, but I think... Which isn't a bad thing. That's kind of more just like... The games that are good. (laughs) I think that's just a testament to the Switch... As an indie machine? It is, because and anyone can just put out a game. The I mean, fact, Jump Rope Challenge is on there. I have Jump Rope Challenge. <laughs> that's Nintendo made. It's free. We should play Jump Rope Challenge. Anyways. We uh, need to play Mario Kart. It's been like 40 minutes. <laughs> Hold on. We're still talking. I think that is also a testament to uh, the price point of indie games nowadays. And a lot of like bigger publishers, I think, are taking notice of how cheap indie games are. Like, uh, like Dang Dolls. <laughs> no, I mean like uh Monkey Ball Banana Mania was only forty bucks. Uh Persona uh Persona 4 Golden when it launched on Steam was twenty bucks. Uh and I think indie games are starting to get braver with their pricing, which is good because they need to like hold their value. You know, they don't want to undersell themselves. Like Cuphead is twenty dollars, but it's a great twenty dollars. But there's that's all that proves the negative side of the big companies, because they spend millions of dollars on a game, so they have to make millions of dollars from that game. Right. So they have to have those expensive prices, because that's how much money they put into resources. I can download Unity for free and make Undertale and sell more than a Nintendo game, who spent millions of dollars, and I'll just get Unity for free and upload it on a 1980s computer. Right. That I just found at a dumpster. And that's why I think indie games have the privilege of being cheap. is because indie games don't need to pay money to get all of this stuff for their game. But big companies do. Right. Like, they have to hire their employees. Now, I know other indie games, they hire people and they do whatever. Right, like... I just mean mean generalistically. Indie games aren't hiring 70,000 people because then it's not an indie game. Right. Like, I know uh, Clever Endeavor, who made Ultimate Chicken Horse, they're, like, a relatively small team. I think they have less than 10 people. Yeah. Uh, FNAF, for then, the longest time, was just made by one guy. And they probably, until, like, split uh, the money. That's probably how it just works. Until uh, until Sister Location came out, which is really funny that uh, 
the way that they're listed in alphabetical order under a under the click team publishing that they're in series order like one two three four five six seven <laughs> anyways sorry uh so until fnaf 5 these were all like modeled programmed like sound designed everything was scott cawthon until fnaf 5 where he hired voice actors and that's the only thing different and musicians because Scott doesn't make the music. It was originally stock music. It's until... entertaining to me is the art is different in every picture. What do you mean? Like Like it's just a different kind of style. Look at the look at the second one, then look at sister location. Like one of them's glossy and one of them's like rough and Yeah, I think that's because sister location is supposed to be like more sci fi ish high tech. I, I'm not saying that he did anything wrong or is bad. I'm just making an observation. I right. just like that it's like different in the different games like i just like that the cover art is a different kind of style mm -hmm. or like it's different detailed so like i i like that indie games like they start off just being these small productions by one person and then they slowly as devolve they slowly like evolve into like bigger productions i'm just i'm just looking at the first friday like, game uh, versus the one on the right and i'm like before and after you get <laughs> called a big corporation <laughs> it's like this deep scary game like to, hey welcome to freddy's five nights pizza cafe remix <laughs> you like, know what I mean? that's what it looks like, like like after uh rivals was originally just dan and a few others right and uh and now it's bigger now on rivals 2 They've got, like, a large, bigger team, and just Rivals as a whole brand. Like, they've got companies making merchandise. They've got uh, artists and writers who are writing for the comics. They've got uh, 3D modelers for the new game that's coming out. They've got uh, pixel artists for the spinoffs coming out. Uh, they've got fan creators that they've collaborated with to buy the rights to those fan-created characters, which... Okay, I want to talk about that for a little bit because I, I genuinely think fan-created content interacting with legitimate content is going to be the future of gaming. Maybe. Because, like... Uh, Mainstream would never allow it. Which is pathetic. Is it? Because that goes into what I was going to say. Cause is that mainstream also is forced to not be as good of a game in a certain way because of what they are and aren't allowed to say or put in the game. Well, indie games and pe people who make indie games can make this terrifying Freddy. They can make this really scary art. Right. But like, have mainstream you seen the Mario can't do that. Have you seen the trailers for uh, Five Nights at Freddy's Plus? No. It's a reimagining of uh, FNAF 1 by uh, a fan developer. Who uh, originally, uh, the story goes, uh, this fan dev uh, uh, called Fiznom was making an open source uh, remake of FNAF 2. And Scott Cawthon was like, whoa, we don't, I don't want you to release this for free because it's way too close to FNAF 2. And people are going to be like, oh, I'm just going to play this instead of buying FNAF 2. So he ceased and desisted it. Uh, but then Phil Morg was like, uh, crit in the, his conversations with Scott, criticizing what he would do differently and like saying, I don't like this and this and I would do this differently. And so Scott invited him to be a part of the Fanverse initiative and make his own reimagining of the original FNAF, which is super cool. Yeah. And so the Fanverse which, initiative... I think they're both right in their own way where it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't want you to publish this game because they wouldn't buy mine right. because you just copied my game. So now, instead of releasing that for free, I'll give you the time and like money and resources to, to make actually it develop it and we'll publish it and charge yeah. money for it. And that's probably what should happen. And so the Fanverse initiative, that's a very unique one in the Fanverse initiative because all the other ones were existing uh, fan game properties that he bought the rights to. And uh, what he's doing is... All these fan game developers, they are still able to do whatever they want with the fan games they're developing to, like, an extent. You know, there's certain guidelines now, like, uh, Scott doesn't like swearing or excessive gore or, like, sex or whatever. Yeah. But they're still able to, like, make them as scary or as not scary or whatever as they want. They still have the freedom to make them 
their own unique personal projects, but now they're officially licensed by Scott Cawthon and their official Five Nights at Freddy's spinoffs, and they're going to be ported to like consoles and mobile. And uh, later in this year, actually, they're going to be releasing um, like merchandise in stores of these fan game characters, which is crazy. It's so like genuinely cool to see these fan projects like thriving in an official capacity. But my question is, what if this dude that they hired off the street, I know he wasn't literally on the street, but you right. know what I'm saying. Instead of sticking with his team, Scott hired this guy. That's just a loose cannon. He doesn't like know this guy. That sort of thing you, has actually you might, happened. You might say, um, people are going to be like, oh, well, don't insult that guy. Yeah, well, how did you feel about Zero or Nairo before they got canceled? How you loved them. You thought they were great people, but then suddenly they got canceled because of the stuff they did before. You don't know who you're hiring, even though you may think they're cool people or you love them. You might, like, this is a loose cannon. And what if they go to release this game and that guy put something in the game that just bypassed all the other devs? And that's why main people, like mainstream games like Nintendo, can never do that. Because they can't fully trust whoever they do unless they're officially part of the Nintendo team. And also, you saw how just letting the public do what they want went with Smash Brothers, where every other thing was of the characters sexually right. for the stage thing. So you can't just give, like... You know how Rivals has their, like... Um, you allow the people to upload their own mods Steam to Workshop. the game. Steam yeah. Workshop, yeah. N mainstream, like Nintendo and stuff, could never do that because of what people would do to the characters. Right. And that's that's the good and bad. That is that. a legitimate concern because there are, like, certain FNAF fan games that are very vulgar, like uh, Day Shift at Freddy's or uh, <laughs> Five Nights at F-Boys. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Is that an F and F remix? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Funkin' at Freddy's and Urple Guy V2, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and, um, On podcast dude, episode three. Oh, I'm so ready for Funkin' at Freddy's version two. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> Which is nothing against the guy that is got a, hired. That it's is just, a legitimate concern because uh, I don't want to say anything like definitive because I don't know the specifics of the situation, but one of the Fanverse devs uh, who made uh, One Night at Flumpty's <laughs> Uh, it's just a funny name. <laughs> one Night at Flumpty's, uh, after he made the third game, which is the one that Scott Cawthon commissioned for the fanverse, uh, he got outed for doing something. I don't remember what it was or like mm -hmm. how he got outed, but I remember like something happened and people were like, oh, this guy like needs like help because like, he did something really bad. And so uh, that is a very legitimate concern. But I think what makes it a little different is that now Scott owns the intellectual property to those fan games. So if he wants to continue those projects with different developers, he could. That's similar to like Rivals now, like with the four characters that are in the base game that were fan made characters, they now own those characters. And uh, Fortnite does a similar thing, believe it or not, where a uh, certain fan made skin concepts get added into the game. They'll, like, pay the people who designed the skins to own those skins. Like, just recently, uh, it's actually in the news segment right here. Uh, we're just getting Mario Kart news now. Oh, come on. Where's Charlotte? Where's Charlotte? Where's Charlotte? Do they not have it? Okay, whatever. There's a skin called Charlotte that was made by a fan. And just yesterday, they added a remixed version of it to the shop. And they still say in the promotion for it, Charlotte, original Charlotte was designed by so-and-so. But they own the rights to Charlotte. They can do whatever they want with her. So mm -hmm. it's still created by the fan. It's still... It's a symbiotic relationship because the fan gets to create fan works for a thing that they love. And the thing that they love is officially acknowledging it and absorbing it into itself and making it a part of itself. So it's a fan directly contributing to what they do. And if the fan later goes down and does something wrong, then the art becomes separated from the artist because it's now a part of that conglomerate of the original product. Yes, I agree. 
but it depends on the way they brand themselves. When you look at a FNAF game, you're going to think about Scott. Right. When you look at Smash Bros, you're going to think about Sakurai. When you look at Rivals, you're going to think of Dan. So if something happened in Rivals, you'd be like, oh, Dan let this through. Oh, Scott let this through. And they will permanently have some kind of a link or connection to that. It's like if, um, if those people who got canceled, like Smash Bros people, Minecraft people, whoever got canceled, if... MK Leo, the biggest and best Smash Bros. player, turned around and started defending Zero. What would that look like on him? Right. Like whenever everything, whenever all the allegations started about the other people, that would put MK Leo in a permanent negative spotlight from everybody. It's like, oh, he defended a predator or a whatever. Right. Um, not saying any of these things are true. We're not saying any of these things aren't true. I'm just using this them is as just examples. What happened? It's just right. the You're... examples of the things that happened. Right. Or so-called happened because I wasn't right. there. The know. alleged, the allegedly stuff. thing happened. That's the <laughs> word for it. Now, that would put a permanent black mark on Leo. Right. Not that there's anything wrong. With that. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. This is two white guys. It's it'd be a permanent white mark on some. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. It'd be a it, like. So from yeah. now on, if Scott himself, he's not going to change his name and his identity and disassociate himself from the other success he's done. He's going to continue to put out games as Scott Coffin. Right. Every other game he puts out is going to be like, is this going to, do I have to ch- double check this game now? Right. And I think and that's the he problem. does that's everything, the problem that, with doing that. everything that gets published does go through him. Mm-hmm. But he's not going to catch everything. And uh, I think I'd be more worried about the stuff that people do outside of the game than the stuff they put in the game. Well, that's... Because that's what happened with the uh, Flumpy's guy. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. Cause, Allegedly. Because people, people would say, oh, is this the type of person that Scott hires on his team? Mm-hmm. Someone who does drugs, who does sexually assault, whatever. explicit yeah. things, whatever it is. It's like, oh, he was friends with... Because he, he already made a statement about he hired the guy on and the guy's cool. So is this the kind of person Scott thinks is cool? That's what I mean. Is that it's just going to be Scott's name getting bashed if whatever. And other people, like, let's say there was one dude who was like the head of some big popular game, but they weren't announcing that they were like this big head of the popular game. Who they hire on and the repercussions that come from that wouldn't be as big. Like, I if think, Nintendo as a name brand hired someone who went off and did crack, they'd be like, oh, it's a big company. Right. That's like what happened with uh, the original voice actor for Byleth in Fire Emblem Three Houses. I don't remember what he did, but he did something bad. And so Nintendo just fired him and replaced him. And, like, that, that didn't reflect on Nintendo. It reflected on the guy. Because it's a big company. And right. as a it, big company, it's a faceless company, they're supposed to outsource. But when you have a face... Then everything gets blamed on the face. Right. Like when like you're, you're no, white guy number one. Like so when whenever I go do something, <laughs> you're gonna get canceled. Like when it's like, or when Nathan. <laughs> that's a Castle Crashers reference. <laughs> go watch episode uh, five. But it's of like, Castle Crashers. like when you're Four like when you're like Scott Games or Dan Farnese <clears throat> LLC. Or Super Lucky Tales is J Tales. Yeah, or like a. Uh, the company that made Celeste used to be called uh, Matt Makes Games. Yeah. When you are the face of the company, hiring people or outsourcing or doing whatever isn't just you're a big company who had no way of checking all the millions of people ex- extremely excruciatingly because right. you had other stuff to do. That is a very good point. However, I would argue that it shouldn't deter you from interacting with fans in yeah, that way. Yeah, I'm not saying you shouldn't interact with it. Because I still think... You're doing more good than harm. But that's why I was saying mainstream games cannot do the thing that you said should well, happen. Because I said mainstream games can't really do it as well as indie games. Sonic and the Hedgehog said, does. For as much crap as I give Sonic, they are very, like, uh, fan forward, I guess. And the only Sonic game that's, like, fan-made that people love is the Sonic Mania or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's the one that actually is good and is well. Yeah. But that's, like... Pretty much a purely fan-made game. And uh, that I've has played, nothing to do with the big company. <laughs> I've played the... Uh, Which it does. I've played uh, the Sonic Roblox game. 
which was uh, developed by Roblox devs, not like like fan Roblox devs who are making games for Roblox. Uh, they're not like official Roblox employees, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was pretty good for what it is. It wasn't bad. I enjoyed playing it. And uh, I did have a little nitpicks with it because, you know, it's a Roblox game. It's not going to be perfect. But uh, for what it is, as an officially licensed Sonic Roblox game, I enjoyed it. But this kind of goes, bringing it back, you said it's not uh, with the, uh, not involved with the company as much. When the company does start getting involved, things go a little sour. Like uh, with Sonic Origins recently, that was some of the people who worked on Mania also worked on this. And Sonic Origins has had very mixed reviews because of how like buggy and weird and unfinished it is. And that goes back to the whole, like, uh, the big companies aren't giving the developers enough time and money to make the best product possible. That's what happened with Sonic Origins. Like, the devs have come out and said, we weren't given the appropriate, like, time that we needed to make this the best collection possible. Yeah. So I think, in the in the end, working with fans is a net positive. No matter, like, and there are still going to be some negatives when you're working with fans because you never know, like, how they're going to act. But that's also with just any employee in general, right? Like, no matter who you hire on, they can go and do something. So I, the only difference is that this is a person who is, like, a big fan of your work already. I don't disagree. There's not, like, some kind of big claim. I just, I don't right. disagree with that. I just personally feel like big companies have a harder time with it than indie. No, I definitely Either agree. Purely for the fact of just the numbers. Right. Mario. Look, if you put out Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, for example, you know how many people bought that? Compared to how many people bought or is going to buy the FNAF game with that other guy? Mm-hmm. It's it's such a it's gonna be a lot wider of an audience, right? And it's gonna be a lot. Actually, it's gonna be wider in every way, right? In age like, and race and like the people that uh, location that it's bought in, it's just gonna be bigger. The people that a game like Mario Kart Eight Deluxe appeals to is a much wider net than say, uh, Fazbear Fanverse game that just came out. Pop Goes Arcade. I I have an idea. That you may or may not like, but I feel like this could help explain it. You know how in Mario Party 8, Kamek said that word that's like a slur in Britain or British or whatever Uh it was? That would happen constantly if they just let fans be in the thing. Well, like... I think words like that, because let's say Nintendo hired four or five people from America to work on a game... They're going to put a bunch of words in there that aren't supposed to be in there. Well, Nintendo... And then Nintendo's going to have to go and, like, clean that out. But why do that when they can just keep the people that they already have who already know everything they are and aren't allowed to do? They do that anyways. Because, like, they have two separate localization teams for Europe and for America. So even if the game is made in America, it would still have to pass through their quality control team in Europe. That's what I'm saying. Like, why even hire weird indie people in the first place whenever you can just put out half-baked games and you get the same cells. That's what they did with Snipper Clips. They hired uh, SFB. Nintendo? Yeah. Like, uh, Snipper Clips is made by... Snipper Clips is published by Nintendo, but it is, in by all means, an indie game made by SFB. They're the same company that made uh, Detective Grimoire and uh, Tangle Tower. Yeah. And uh, they actually used to be called the Super Flash Bros because <laughs> they made Flash games on Newgrounds and stuff. But uh, they changed it to SFB. Anyways. Um, but so Nintendo has worked with indie projects like that before. Like, uh, look at even more extreme example would be Cadence of Hyrule, which is a, a, an indie game. It's an it's a officially licensed Zelda crossover with an indie series, mm-hmm. which 
if you haven't played Necrodancer or Cadence of Hyrule, they're very good games. Go play them. So I think... I think Nintendo just wants to push out games as fast as possible. Right. And when you're working with people that are not contracted underneath your company, you can't always force them to do what you want. Right. And well, I think that's a part of it. If Nintendo's like, pump this game out in three months, and the people go, I'm not going to do that, and they don't have like this contract from Nintendo saying they have to do that, then there's a conflict like for no reason. They would have that contract, though, because it's a big like professional business. They're going to like have those... like legal mandates and contracts and whatnot. Well, I think so, but also not. Like Just because the Mario Rabbids people already created the Mario Rabbids, they already created this game before they showed it to Nintendo. They got the contract to continue the game after they've already made it. Like, they made the, like, pitch version and they pitched it and then they yeah, made the full game? Yeah, because the person for Mario Rabbids, you know, that was original artwork mm -hmm. that they did. And they went to Nintendo after the game was already, like, partway made and this whole thing was already created. So that deadline slash contract doesn't matter because they already have the game made and worked on. I think So they can't be like, oh, you have to work on this game and put it out by this amount of time. Because the people who are showing the game to Nintendo already have the game. Well, like, after they sign that contract, then they say, okay, finish it by this time. But you don't know how finished these games are by the time the contract gets there. I think what if Kate It's a Hyrule was already made, and then they go, Nintendo, what do you think about our game? I want to show you this game. And then it's like it's like 80% of the way through, and Nintendo goes, okay, you have three months. And they crunch time the last 20%, and then they're good. I feel like... I'm not saying Kate It's a Hyrule specifically. I just mean generalize that's, other games like that. I feel like that's on the developers... Well, no, 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 not on the developers for being forced to crunch once the contract is signed, but, like, making a game with the expectation of it getting contract signed, like, making a fan project with the expectation of it, like, okay, I'm going to go to the developer and I'm going to be like, yeah, now publish this, please. But what Like, I'm that's what happened, uh, there's a similar thing that happened within the realm of FNAF. Uh, there was a fan game called Afton Built that uh, was specifically made as a pitch to Scott Cawthon for the fanverse. And Scott Cawthon uh, ultimately decided that he didn't want it as part of the fanverse. And it was like a very like nearly complete demo, and they worked really hard and spent a lot of like volunteer time and money on it. Yeah, but, but like, he shouldn't have done it if he didn't want it. Right. Yeah, so like, it makes sense. They, the version that they pitched to him, like, it didn't work out. So I think... In that case, if you're making a fan project, don't make it with the hopes of, okay, I'm going to pitch this, and it's I'm going to get it accepted, and it's going to be awesome. Make it with the hopes of, I'm going to make this because I'm passionate about what I'm working on. But how many people do you think have done that and then showed it to Nintendo? Because there's no way Mario Rabbids or Cadence of Hyrule would be the only games that people went, hey, Nintendo, what do you think of this idea? Right. There, it's not even close. There's probably hundreds of thousands of games. Like all the fan games Nintendo's struck down over the years, like a, another Metroid 2 remake. Like or, what if, uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if people the made these games and showed them to Nintendo, and then Nintendo said no, and they go, okay, and just publish it on their own. Like just change the characters and stuff? Yeah. Like even the... Uh, like just slightly change the characters. The Mother things. 3 fan translation? Mm-hmm. Uh, they just said, here, Nintendo, have it for free. We we made this because we love the game. Just please use the translation and release it. And they didn't. And that's uh, what you said, where it's like they just changed the characters. That happened with uh, a fan-made Mother 4. Uh, they're rebranding the game from Mother 4 into a game called Oddity. So it's now their own IP, but it's still its DNA is still as a Earthbound yeah. fan project. Kind of like Bug Fables. Yeah. Except where it's, it's Bug Fables in their own original unique game, but if but you just reskinned the characters to be Mario characters, then it'd be a it'd Mario game. It'd be a game. Paper Mario yeah. game. But that wasn't made with the intention of being a Paper Mario game. It was right. made with the intention of being Bug Fables. I, I agree. You're right. Like, they didn't make it with Mario characters. Right. But they did create Bug Fables 
because Nintendo wasn't making a good Paper Mario. Right. Which well, is like, a difference. You're right. Yeah. It, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Uh, they just did their own thing. Which is, again, good. Yeah. Like, it's great that people can just be like, if the big company won't do it, I'll just do it myself. And then mm-hmm. they do it. And I think that's the reason why indie games are so good and popular. Is because the big company can't do everything. And if the big company did do everything, indie games wouldn't be a thing anymore because every big company would hire indie game developers and right. then there would be no more indie games because nothing can be an indie game if it's all big company. Right. I, I just really like the culture of making indie games and like making fan projects and like... I just think some of the most fun that I've had with uh, playing games and like in like the past few months or so has been like playing Friday Night Funkin' mods. I think our difference in definition is what defines our contrast here. Like, so like, what do you think an indie game is? Uh. A game developed and made by a small team of people. Like, even if it's published by a big publisher, if it's made by, like, a relatively small team, then it's an independent project. And that's where we differ. Because I think if it's published by a big developer, it's no longer an indie game. It was developed as an indie game, but it was not published as an indie game. That's fair That's my opinion. That doesn't mean it's right. That's just what I think. Would you call Snipper Clips an indie game? No. I'd be like, it's 100% a Nintendo indie game, or a Nintendo game. Okay. I wouldn't even consider Snipper Clips an indie game. I didn't even know that until today that you told me Snipper Clips was an indie game. I didn't even know that. Because, like, the same people who made T- Tangle Tower, which is very much an indie game, are the same people who made Snipper Clips. Yeah, but who's the first name right before Snipper Clips? That's a great point. And then who's the first name before Tangle Towers? That makes it an indie game. That's, okay. my, that's my opinion. And I think approaching this conversation, that's a little bit of a difference in our perspectives, and that's what creates our opinions I a little bit. Not that you're right or I'm right. It's, it's just, not a triple A game either, though. Yes. It's just a game. <laughs> it's weird to say that, yeah. but I agree. It's got the spirit of an indie game. I don't think everything is either a triple A or an indie game. It's not black and white. Because, like, like, modern Nintendo would have never made a game like Snipper Clips without the indie team. I'm just going to agree with you because I don't even want to agree with that, but I don't want to disagree either because, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Nintendo has been known to just pull out some BS just randomly, and it was a really good and creative game. Right. They are the people that made ARMS. <laughs> like, who, who knows? I mean, Nintendo's the people who made the, the wrestling game. Yeah, but Nintendo is also the same person who made Mario versions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 with the exact same idea in my, like behind it. Right. Not, like, you, they're, you they're get what I'm They're the same people who made New Super Mario Bros. U and Wii and 2. And it's just the same game, just slightly different levels in some of them. Some of them are just an yeah. exact carbon copy, but with a Luigi slapped on it. Oh, yeah, I forgot about New Super Luigi U. But then they also made that Kirby game. Uh, Kirby Superstar Soccer? Whatever you played at the beginning. Yeah, I yeah. think that's it. And, like, they've they've published all sorts of crazy games from good to bad to wild and wacky to soft and tame. Right. And N- it's... You Nintendo just really is know. an anomaly like that. But you, were, but you were saying Nintendo wouldn't create snipper clips. Maybe I'm wrong, because Nintendo did make Sushi Striker. <laughs> But I, that's what I was saying. I didn't want to agree with you because I feel like Nintendo... Because you said they would never make it. They, But I feel like they could. Probably wouldn't have. Yes. I feel like the possibility of them making a game like Snipper but Clips... It but, wouldn't have been exactly the same yes. as Snipper Clips yeah. without... It's, the indie it's got that indie soul to it. I gotta be honest with you. Whenever I played Snipper Clips... I played around half of it with Sebastian. I played it around half of it. We need to play Snipper Clips for white guys. And I did not know it was an indie game, and I never felt like it was an indie game. 
I always felt like Sniffer Clips was just a Nintendo game that Nintendo created to use the Joy-Cons. Like how Nintendo goes, hey, we have Wii Motion Plus. Here's 20 Wii Motion Plus exclusive games. And that's what I felt about Snipper Clips with the Joy-Cons. To my understanding... I, I just thought the whole point of Snipper Clips was to show off the Joy-Cons, and I thought it was a Nintendo game. To my understanding, Snipper Clips was already an idea in SFB's heads, and then Nintendo saw that idea and approached them and was like, hey, we're making this new system with these controllers, and we think this would be a great way to show them off. Yeah. It's always had the same vibes to me as... um. What's the what's the Nintendo Switch game that was re- like? What's the Wii Sports of Nintendo Switch? What was the game that was released with it? I can't remember the name. Like Nintendo World. Or Don't Nintendo compare World. it to One Two Switch. One Two Switch. Don't compare now, Snipper Clips listen, to listen, One Two listen, Switch. Listen. What's the point of One Two Switch? What is it? It doesn't have one. To show off the Joy Cons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To yeah. show off the new technology for the new system. And to be exciting that this is our new thing that right. no one else is doing. And I two, thought Snipper Clips was promotion number two. But Snipper Clips has substance. One Snipper two, Clips is... I just think they're different types of games. Yeah. I think... I've played both of them. I've played 1-2 Switch. It's very hollow. I think 1-2 Switch is a WarioWare slash Worldwide Classics. And one Snipper two Clips is, is more like, of a tech demo. For, yeah. like, what the Joy-Cons can do. I think that's what I just said. <laughs> Snipper Clips is more of an actual game. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think okay. they're made for different things. So we agree. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think that 1-2 Switch is supposed to be WarioWare, but, like, just to show off the tech. And Snipper Clips is supposed to be, like, if we made a game, we could do this with the game. Okay. Like, you've already experienced what the Joy-Cons could do. Now let me show you how it works in a game. And that's how I always thought Snipper Clips was until like an hour ago. <laughs> well, it's it can be both, you know. Which I'm not saying it isn't that, but I never realized it was an indie game. Like it is still an indie game, but it's also made to show off the Switch technology. Mm-hmm. So there's there but is they, that overlap. But if what you said is true, I don't even know if it is or not. Or you were just giving an example, but. If they already had this in mind and then Nintendo decided it would be good for the Joy-Cons, then the people who made the game weren't intending for use with the Joy-Cons. They were intending it for like an Xbox or something like that, like a normal controller. Right. So it has like a... Which Snipper Clips still can be played with normal controllers, I think. So it's... I thought they only used Joy-Cons for the Switch. No, I think you can use... Hold on. But we gotta, we gotta play our Mario Kart. I'm checking to see if Snipper Clips can be played with <laughs> Pro Controllers. And now we're playing our Mario Kart. We have to. <laughs> I know it's a fun conversation, but we have to record an actual White Guys video today. I think it's just Joy-Cons. Is it? Yeah. Huh. That's why I thought Nintendo made the game purely for Joy-Cons, because mm-hmm. that's all you can use for it. It's got that, like... Unless the DLC has it. Kind of weirdish mixture of like I love their faces that's so funny we need to play some brick clips on my guys One it's day. like the perfect two player game but I like how it's got that it's a mixture of Nintendo DNA with indie DNA I can feel it like it feels like a Nintendo game but it also feels like an indie project my question is, like how uh, is that actually what it is? Or are you saying that because you know it's an indie game? What if you did not know this was an indie game? Which is hard to imagine that perspective because there's no way you can. Whenever, I wasn't really sure what an indie game like truly was back when this first came out, like five years ago. Because I was, how old was I? I was like 2017. 14. I was 14. And uh, I just thought it was a fun game. Yeah. Which I feel like that's the attitude everyone should have. Like, I hate to make such a definitive statement, but I feel like we shouldn't... Well, it is important to recognize that certain games are made by, like, certain groups of people. Oh, yeah, that's how I play games. You should just be, like, just whatever you find the most fun, play. That's what I do. That's why I never go online and complain about video games being bad or unfinished. 
is because I... This I've, is... This is going to be a really stupid example. I, I play video games and go, oh, is this fun? Yes or no? And then I just play it. It's like race. <laughs> While it is important that we have diversity and that we acknowledge each other's history and heritage and the importance that that carries, we should be able to look past it and appreciate each other for just being people. And in the same vein, <laughs> in the same vein, <laughs> in, the, in the same vein, it, while it is important to recognize this game is AAA, this game is indie, they're both just video games and you should be able to appreciate them for what they are. Speaking of race, let's play Mario Kart. <laughs> Start the race!